Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans. Yes, yes, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition, another episode of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. I'm Ashwell St. Patrick Hewitt, one half of the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. And with me as ever is the one and only Santoki Nagilendran. Santoki, how are you doing? Yeah, Mash, all good. Excited for this episode. And it's quite a symbolic one, Mash. We're recording this on the day when Craig Brathwaite has led his men to an historic win in Australia at at the Gabba, captured the hearts of fans around the world, with the performances. And today, Mash, with this special episode is a historical episode. We're going to be looking at a book which has recently come out, which I've read this weekend, Son of Grace, about the life of Sir Frank Worrell, who would have been 100 this year, born in 1924. And that's symbolic, as I say, he was someone who, you know, 60 odd years ago, went to Australia with a West Indies team. People were bemoaning the state of test cricket and how bad this West Indies teams will do. But the performances of that side of in 1960 in Australia, 1961, captured the hearts and imaginations of fans around the world and sort of reinvigorated people's love for test cricket. So it's quite symbolic on this day we're having the topic. So we're very excited, Mash, to have the author of this book on the show tonight. Yeah, most definitely. And and, and as you say, I think I think we shouldn't, like we can't put enough kind of significance on on the fact that what happened today yesterday depending on when people are listening to this with how there was almost a feeling in 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 Brisbane in that game where the it was almost like the Aussie fans were cheering the West Indies on to try and win the game right and when when you think about all of the many things that Frank Worrell is famous for one of the first few things people talk about is that whole kind of ticker tape parade when the West Indians were making their way home and the Australians being like, wow, what a team. We can't believe what we saw. So everything's kind of tying in together. Historic win, 100 years since uh, Frank was born and kind of almost like a, a weird parallel between how the two how the two tours um, have been kind of taken in by the certainly the Australian public and maybe even the wider Uh, cricket public itself but we can talk and we can kind of wax lyrical but the best person to wax lyrical on this is none other than the author of said book uh son of grace vanessa uh vanessa baksh and she is on today uh to talk about the book and you know just kind of just take us through the process all the kind of stories i mean you've read it back to back santoki so we're just we're just you know eager to kind of delve into it and understand understand more about the man Frank Worrell. But within, without any further ado, let me bring Vanessa on. Hello, Vanessa. How are you doing? Hi. Nice to be here. A pleasure. Especially on this historic day. Exactly. <laughs> so you just took the words out of my mouth. I was literally about to say, we we planned to do this episode, what, about two weeks ago, maybe a week and a half ago. None of us could have known what was going to happen uh, on the, on the the on in the test match itself. Uh, and the significance of it. So before we even get into um, the kind of your book and everything about that, just what are your initial reflections on almost like the historical significance of the the, the test match that, that West Indies have just won? And if you drew any kind of parallels with some of the research that you were doing around Frank Worrell, et cetera? I'm always drawing parallels. <laughs> 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 the thing is that if you think about what the Thai Test match in 1960-61 meant, it was a complete shock to the world in terms of the, well, the fact of it being a Thai Test. But it was also a series that brought cricket back to life. Mm. And I think the parallel that I saw or what I saw I think I saw today, last night, was that whole business of the West Indies being there and it being almost a predictable, you know, that they would not win. And despite Shamar's performance in the first test, 
which was astonishing by itself. Mm. It was the complete dominance that he had in that game, despite the, the damaged toe. And it all that reminded me of um, what I think it was Malcolm Marshall mm. with the broken finger. I think it was. And what we saw, what we saw, I think, was that kind of heroism, that kind of courage, and that complete determination to do the job and not just to do it. He was. You could see how fired up he was. Mm. You could see it. It was brilliant to see because it is that kind of energy and that kind of determination that I think has been a flagging thing with the West Indies teams. Most of the time, we can see from body language when they have given it up. We can see. And I think what he instilled today or what he introduced into the match was that that traditionally Australian never give up kind of attitude. And I think I, I have not seen a test match like that for a really, really long time. It, it really transported me back in time. I mean, we have seen all the nail biting finishes of T20s and, and one day internationals, and they have their own charisma. And excitement mm. but for a test to come down to the end where it just seemed like you it could go anywhere mm. you know and and for it to have gone the West Indies way would have been for some super phenomenal performance and I think that was what we saw I don't I, at the same time that in their match was going on Yes. India and England. And I saw the tail end of it. And it was, again, it seemed like India was going to trample all over England. And here, and there was another seven wicket haul from a debutant. So it, I think, in a, in a sense, those two tests coming at the same time were really very striking moments in test history before like santoki is going to come in and kind of take the lead on the like the initial part of what we want to discuss but i'm just intrigued that when you research a book into someone as as great as frank worrell and particularly kind of like themes around identity and i'm just thinking about the words you've just used to describe what you saw today were there did you almost kind of sense or feel why West Indian identity and what makes West Indian identity, particularly on the cricket field, is so special? Because there was something, there's something intangible today that I don't think you can kind of, you can't bottle it, you can't really describe it. And, the, and we were talking before we press record, I was saying to you that my dad rang me, like he, and we never talk cricket anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but he rang me and wanted to just talk cricket. And it, it kind of felt like a day where we saw and felt what West Indian identity can feel like or what the significance of the West Indian cricket team can feel like in moments like this. Did, did you kind of sense something like that? In, in Interesting that you should raise that because in 2007... I did an MPhil in cultural studies at the University of the West Indies, mm. and the subject was West Indian identity through the eyes of the cricketer. Yeah. So what I had done was looked at 100 years of cricket autobiographies, which were the primary sources, and biographies. So it started off really with work from Larry Constantine and a lot of the others. So to, for me, I had already been looking at how identity, West Indian identity was being expressed through the eyes of the cricketers. Mm. 
And this was something, well, I suppose that CLR James had already done, you know, his thesis on um, Beyond the Boundary was based on that sense of the, the, the identity. And so for me, it was something I had always been fascinated with. In fact, I'm hoping to take that thesis and sort of reconstruct it a bit mm. to look at more of the players than I did then. But Frank was one of the people that I you know, looked at, his life. So for quite a long time, people have been saying, you should do a biography of Frank Worrell. And I wanted to because I knew his, I knew about his impact, more his impact as a West Indian, <clears throat> to West Indian identity. Mm. And I didn't get around to it until about 2016. And I see, I've seen a couple of reviews where they suggest that I've been at it for decades or more than a decade, but that's not quite true. It really, it may have seemed so, but it was actually in 2016 that I started working on it. And if I may tell a little story about how difficult getting material mm. in ways you don't expect. I didn't expect, for example, the first real interview I did was with Everton Weeks. Mm -hmm. So knowing Everton's age uh, at the time, and that, well, I didn't, re I had no never really, um, we didn't know each other, I had introduced myself. I went to Barbados to spend the day, and he was very gracious. I went to his home, but I hired a videographer to record the interview. And we had a lovely interview. It was brilliant. And when I was returning in the evening, the videographer said to me, the people at the uh, immigrate at custom sorry when you're coming through the airport and they're scanning you the security is going to want to scan the usb drive that the interview was on but don't let them because what we have seen is that the audio is lost when they put it through their scanners so i dutifully asked the woman there to please not scan this. And she refused. And I told her all the reasons where I had gone, what I had done, why it was so important that we don't take a risk with it. She just re ignored me, refused, scanned it, and guess what? All the audio was lost on that. I'm just saying, these are the kinds of things that are unexpected, A, eh? but they're also the things that you don't why would you, it's part of an attitude i think mm. you know, people don't respect the idea of archiving or you know that kind of thing and i'm very passionate about that you know? so that was one of my first experiences in terms of trying to collect material for fortunately i mean it took a lot of trying to figure out how to do it. But eventually I was able to get the audio back from the guy. It was 2016, a lot of, a lot of dramas. Mm -hmm. you, you start Son of Grace with a personal story about trying to research, as you were mentioning, and trying to locate a copy of a comic book you read as a child about uh, Frank Worrell. And then you also mentioned, interestingly, early on about the amnesic amnesiac quality of West Indian memory and sort of we may have monuments of players like Sir Frank Wawel but we don't perhaps acknowledge the legacy and the context of who he was. Do you think that's something that's very specific to West Indies as a region and do you think this has affected sort of West Indian identity the, this sort of lack of acknowledgement of our history? I think so. I have tried 
to find evidence of it being a continuous thing. But really, if you look at it globally, there are few places where there is not a sense of treasuring their ancestries, treasuring our histories. I don't know if a lot of it has been a legacy of slavery and indentorship when sometimes I, I feel that people think it is better to forget, to put things behind them. I have encountered a lot of that but I also think that it is something that they, maybe it is the colonial background as well. When the histories that we were taught were the histories that the, the, the colonists, sorry, the colonials wanted us to learn so that for us, it was never our history. And the idea of our history became something I think that is like not something that we are, I, I don't want to say something that we deserve to have, but it just seemed to be that it was always other people's versions. And interestingly, when I was doing the research for my film thesis, what I discovered was that while there were and are quite a lot of autobiographies quite a lot of biographies, they were mostly ghostwritten. And they were ghostwritten by, by mainly by English people. And even if they had the cooperation of the, the subjects themselves, they did not and could not bring to me the texture that would make us feel that hair is something or somebody or some place that I recognize. And so I think that we did not have, we do not, and we did not have that culture. I would like to think that it is becoming so now that there is a lot more work that people are doing from within the Caribbean that tell our stories. But as I have been told more than once, the process of finding information is really, really very difficult. And it takes a tremendous amount of legwork and hard-headedness to be able to track down stuff. You know, I got so many disappointments along the way, but sometimes they lead, as Bob says, one door closes, another one is open. <laughs> Yeah. So in um in your biography of it's it's a very comprehensive one of uh Frank Wall was what would unfortunately be a short life. He died aged forty two. In terms of the research, what aspects of his life or, or did you find the most problematic in trying to find out more about and research about? Undoubtedly his um philandering and his relationship with alcohol. So Yes, I spoke to many people who knew him and they would say, well, there was that, but they wouldn't give me details. And at some point when I had had enough material, stories, I couldn't publish or write these stories without corroboration and who would corroborate them? Certainly not the, the parties. Everybody was very, if they were alive still. You're talking about people, nameless women, let's say, and possibly not alive. And in terms of the drinking, you just kept hearing all these euphemisms for how he drank a lot. Until one day, um, I said to Everton, come on after a long time of, you know, he would say things and I said, did he drink like more than, more than everybody else? And he said, well, you know, they say that he was number one and I was number two. <laughs> and, and, but, you know, it took time to get these things, but there were many stories. But those were difficult ones to corroborate. And so I got a sense from the, the number of people I had spoken to 
that it existed, but I couldn't. And in any case, the thing that I thought was it he was not uncommon. It is a cultural thing. Heavy drinking was a cultural thing. Heavy womanizing was a culture. Well, I shouldn't say it was a cultural thing, but certainly in these fields where you have a lot of the alpha males, as I refer to them, you're talking about one one area where, where that is prevalent is sports of any kind. And if you look at every sport, you will find that those things existed. What I actually find interesting now is that although in the past you had the reputations, let's say, of the Australians and the English and the West Indians for those, those two characteristics, drinking and womanizing, I am not sure that the athletes of today, they seem to be a lot more health conscious, fit, and given to you know training and things like that. And I don't get a sense that there is a culture anymore of that kind of macho, heavy drinking behavior. I, I, I'm not going to be able to comment on the women thing, the relationships with women. But certainly, I think there is a much more health conscious athlete today. I don't know well, if I'm wrong. Well, uh, I couldn't. I couldn't possibly speculate. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but what I find interesting with you talking about the um, the drinking and the the the, philand the philandering, did when you do, or when someone does um, a biography on someone who has hmm and, and this could be the wrong phrase to use but someone who has like a polished image so to speak mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. i've always wondered for the author if there is kind of if there is like kind of to in and fro in in your mind as to i guess how deep will you go how much will you upset the apple cart because in trying to in trying to peel the onion so to speak in trying to peel back the layers and deep dive and understand who the person is sometimes there's some uncomfortable truths that that, that need to be on picks so did you have to did you battle with that at all or a biography is a biography is a biography do you, like how where do you step in as an author to say i will or won't go as far as i can if that makes sense for me you see there were biographies done previously mm -hmm. and they were what I think uh, really praises to Frank. Mm -hmm. And so I think those biographies, except for Ivor Tennant, which, which I think I mentioned in the book was the exception, they all try to portray him as a saint. And I did not think that was fair for many reasons. One is that he he achieved a remarkable amount of things in his lifetime but he did not do it with a path that was pristine mm. he had to do had to make his own struggles my instinct tells me that even if the culture the general culture was that that frank may have been really dealing with a lot of his own demons in a sense um based on his childhood based on his experiences in barbados and based on his obvious sense of himself as being above a lot of that and the other part of what drove how, or i suppose determined how i approach stuff is that i come from a journalism background mm -hmm. So in the course of my own journalism, you've had to ask some really tough questions. You've had to ask questions. You've had, a, I have had a lot of hostile interviewees. And to me, it didn't make sense to write about Warren. I didn't think it would be fair to his memory to write about him without trying to understand the things that shaped him whether they were what people would consider to be um, good or not. 
you know they i had i had i was accused by someone who saw the first draft somebody from barbados um of trying to just scandalize his name ah right okay so yes i did have to ask those questions but they weren't difficult ones for me my goal was to get at the essence of the man and i really feel that you know we those are the things that i think limit us mm. in the region here in the works that we do because we live in small societies mm. and you can be victimized for a lot of things which i suspect is i am going to feel some backlash about some things too but for example yesterday <laughs> a senior <laughs> diplomat, a retired person with my friend, called me, having read my column, I write a column in the Saturday Express, and said, what are you doing? They're going to come for you, you know? All because I talked about wars and things like that. And I said, look, at the, look around the world. It's a set of old, rotting men who are the leaders and who are making these decisions to send people to war and devastate countries, right? And he said, you're calling them rotting? And I said, well, it was either rotten or rotting. I chose. <laughs> but I'm saying, I, I know that, that these things, people are very tentative about saying things publicly. And I have never been, I've been, called reckless because I write, I say what I think and, you know. So going off, the, going off the back of that in terms of Frank not being or not having the polished character that I guess everybody kind of sees or it's, it's kind of been reported through history as, do you see, based again, based obviously on the research and what you've written, was he a reluctantly because he's he's poor frank is portrayed um frank is portrayed as almost like the 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 first father of of of, of west indies cricket in, in some senses you, you can say it's frank and then it's clive and then and so on and so forth right um would you say he was a reluctant leader who became the the the, the kind of great leader that everyone saw him as or did he have, based on his upbringing, were those qualities he naturally had, which meant he was the right person um, for the role when it came to him? I actually think that he was not a reluctant leader. Mm. I think that he was very conscious that he was different from childhood. And I think that where he may have thought, in fact, he had that natural bearing of leadership. So even at school, he, he took that rule and he was called arrogant for it. But that was why I don't think that he could stay in Barbados because Barbados was going to squish him and keep him down because they thought he was an upstart. And so at the first opportunity, when he actually left Barbados, he left and went to Jamaica. And he was in Jamaica thinking, but well, what next? And that was when he was spotted and he received an offer to play for Radcliffe in England. And he said, this was it. I had been searching for a way to get out of the West Indies and this was the answer to it so i don't think but in his own that polished manner that was i think he cultivated that he felt that that, that was a necessary accoutrement to have if you are going to be in a leadership position so i don't think it was something that he was it just happened or that he was shying away from it. I think he was deliberately grooming himself 
for a leadership role. He may not have seen it as being, um, he may not have seen past being captain of the West Indies team. Because of course, at that time, <clears throat> I don't think he was thinking too far ahead of a life of cricket. Mm. But to be captain of the West Indies team was definitely on his agenda. I think it's I think it's really important you touched on to talk about his complex relationship with Barbados. As you said, as a child at school, he was labelled big headed or arrogant. Um, he then left as to, to move to Jamaica, as you said. But even when he came back to Barbados and he batted against England, he was booed by the crowd and they thought or saw they saw it as he was trying to sabotage their entertainment by playing so defensively because it was Barbados. Right. And then even later on in life, as a Freemason, Barbados rejected his application to join the lodge because they said he was arrogant. And this sort of contradicts his sort of modern day representation because, as you know, he's on the money, he's on the currency, his face on the currency, his legacy is so celebrated. Sort of what, how would you sort of describe, why, why did he have such a complicated relationship with the land of his birth? Well, I think if you, some of the conclusions I came to, if you think about it, if you think that you are special, and I think he did think he was special, it must hurt, really hurt, that the country of your birth treats you so shabbily and with such a, a disrespect, I would say, to the point, you know, they talk about a prophet is without honor, not, you know, without, in his own home kind of thing. I think it was, it would have cut him deep. And even if he physically moved to other places where he was given a great deal of love and affection, that was a deep wound for him. If I could tell a story, um, someone did a review of the, my, this book, um, somebody local, and he said that it reminded him, reading the book, reminded him of an episode of Frank Worrell when they were having the Goodwill Games, I think. Um, Frank was representing Barbados playing against Trinidad. And Prior Jones, the Trinidadian bowler, at the Queen's Park Oval, bowled a ball to Frank that hit him on his shoulder. And the crowd booed him. I mean, they booed Prior because Frank was their boy. And then when Frank hit the next ball for four, they went crazy. So I'm just saying that this was the kind of adulation he received outside of Barbados. And so I think that it, it had to have been, it was obviously something that cut him very deep. I mean, when he left, as I mentioned in the book, he never returned to live in Barbados again. You, um, sorry, go on, go on, sorry, Penisa. No, no, I, I was uh, just going to say it's something that was reflected, I think, in the way his daughter, Lana, felt about Barbados herself. So how, how do you, um, how do you relate that then to how Barbados views Frank now? Because so you've got the monument um, for Worrell, Walcott, and Weeks um, up at Uwe. Um So I, I mean, you may not have got into it, but where do you think the turning point came? Is was it that was it that death changed the attitude? Do you think, or how how do you think that uh, extrapolated? I think that by the time, let's say in the prologue to the book, I focus on 1963. A big year, it was his final test as captain, and they were playing in England. But Frank's international reputation had overgrown, you know, Barbados or anything like that. They were suddenly, I, I shouldn't say suddenly, they were, they had become aware that he really was an international superstar, that he had represented the West Indies well, and that after that Australia tour, he was, in a sense, untouchable. The university wanted him to come. 
to join the campus, to, to work on the campus. All of this was being discussed in around the time that he went to Australia. So I'm just saying that it it may have been that Bobby just suddenly thought, hey, this is our boy. And we should acknowledge that because of, of, apart from everything else, once he had left Barbados, and when in 1950 they became the three Ws, you had something that was a symbolic bond of Barbadians in the fact that these were the superstars of the Hold on, we may we may have no. some technical, <laughs> we may have some technical difficulties. Um, we'll just wait for Vanessa uh, to come back. Uh, I thought that was me, Santoki, but uh, I thought it was. As well. I panicked, but I thought the dreaded <laughs> Wi-Fi had come. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll just wait for Vanessa to come back. I think actually, I if I'm right, I think I can pause and we can wait until Vanessa is back. Okay. Bear with us, people. Okay, Vanessa. So another interesting aspect of the biography I found really interesting was the dynamic between the three Ws. So Weeks, Worrell and Walker. Obviously, we know what a legendary trio they were on the field. However, in your book, you talk about sort of how there were some tensions, particularly between uh, Worrell and uh, Clyde Walcott. And um, you mentioned a quotation from Clyde Walcott's um, autobiography where he dryly mentions he wasn't a, a, he wasn't asked to be a pallbearer at Walwell's funeral, which sort of hints at that the, the tension between them wasn't um, was unresolved until Walwell's death. Sort of how what did you learn about the dynamic between the trio? It seemed that the, the, it, it had a lot to do with their personalities because it I don't think that they had any particular difficulty while they were members of the team. <clears throat> but I do think that that um, Walcott probably felt that, Claire, um, that Frank got more attention than he did. And Walcott's personality was different. Everton worshipped Frank. And there were many reports of certain acts of sportsmanship generosity that the players or people would say that Walcott wouldn't do that, meaning that he was more about himself in a way that the other two were not. And so I think that in the later years after they stopped playing, the, the paths sort of went their own ways. And Walcott, as you know, became you know head of the ICC, and he was quite a, a a a big personality in world cricket after that. But it's but it seemed that something had happened that was not just a difference in their personalities. It seemed that there was something that fractured it, fractured that relationship. And at first, Everton wouldn't tell me. When I said, but there were hints of this, and he said, somebody told you that, you know, and as far as I know, we were always very tight and things like that. But eventually he told me that, you know, that, that there was some difficulties. Um, they didn't see eye to eye, but I think, um, I think that they understood that they, they publicly, they were the three Ws. And they understood what that meant to West Indians, to everybody. And I don't think that I don't I would not have thought it that there was anything amiss in their relationship. And I still believe that that only happened after they stopped. It, it but part of it had a lot to do with I think when Walcott was named as the deputy, the vice captain in the fifth, late fifties. <clears throat> when Frank had expected that he was going to be named vice captain. And then Walcott turned out to be a quite an autocratic kind of person. And it didn't go down well with the rest of the team. And Frank's own style of leadership has been quite different. In fact, all through the 50s, I would say 
from what I gathered, that even though he was not captain, he was seen as the leader. And so the, his teammates felt that he would go to bat for them, that he would, and when I say that, I, I mean figuratively, he would go out on a limb to make sure that they were receiving, you know, good treatment or as treatment as they should. And this was the kind of generosity of spirit that he had, which I think um, made it clear to everyone that even if he was not the de facto captain of the team, he was the man that everybody went to. And I don't think, um, I don't think in the brief stint that Walcott had as the deputy, the vice captain, I don't think that he got that kind of response or he built that kind of camaraderie with the team. I think they felt that he was kind of talking down to them. Super, that's um, <clears throat> super interesting. And um, I think something that I've read in quite a lot of the reviews um, of the book thus far and something that Santok and I have spoken about um, quite significantly that comes out of the book is the um, suggestion, well, not even the suggestion, that the fact that, that Frank was willing to lead a team to what then apartheid South Africa, which certainly that was news to me. It's not something I, I think, either it's something that's not been told on a regular basis or it's something that was maybe, I'd actually be keen to know if you think it was something that was hidden in retrospect, because I, it was completely complete news to me. Um, was it a case of, because obviously we know about um, uh, the, the, the kind of rebels and what happened in the, in the early 80s and the, the kind of subsequent blowback on them. When you did your research around um, Frank's decision to, to want to go, was it a case of they didn't understand, or I say they, Frank and others, didn't understand the potential ramifications of, of doing that? Of, of going on a tour like that was it a different landscape to what it was when the rebels did it in the in the early 80s well it's interesting first i just want to go back to what you said about it not being common common knowledge mm. that this tour of south africa was proposed it had actually i would tenant had actually written about it so when i saw it i um of course, looked further to find out what were the details. And if it weren't for two things, well, the, the WICBC records that I was able to get my hands on for that period, I would not have got a sense of the kind of dialogues that were taking place between Frank and the West Indies Cricket Board and also the very public discussions of it that were being led by CLR James in the Nation paper, which he was the editor of, and for with whom he had a kind of debate going on, um, including Larry Constantine, who was totally against the tour, but Frank, um, but CLR wanted Frank to go. Mm. And he made very strong cases for Frank to go. So I do not think there was any, because of all the back and forth and all the differing opinions, I mean, it went to the ICC as well for discussion. And um, the West Indies Cricket Board would say to the ICC, well, this is a private tour. We are not party to it. They wrote to Frank and said, look, the Sabok had come to us the year before asking for that tour to happen. And they had said, no, and not under the conditions of apartheid, they were not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And so Frank, basically, I don't think he was ignorant of the ramifications of it. I think he knew. I think he chose to either ignore it because his point, and this was the thing that I was very sorry, I couldn't find, I could only find references in the in the correspondence references to his letter which said that we have um no guaranteed 
payments for our services. Mm. And this is an opportunity for us to, to do this. And that seemed to be the driving consideration for him. And then CLR said, well, he doesn't believe that Frank sees the political elements of this. And if you ask him, he would say, no, he didn't. But I, I don't believe that either. I believe that Frank was aware because he was certainly very politically conscious. Mm. This is a man who was in Manchester, at the Manchester University, at a time when Arthur Lewis was there. And Arthur Lewis, obviously, they were, they were trying to help particularly West Indians who were being subjected to a lot of racism in, in Manchester. And so it isn't like he was ignorant of the conditions. And I wouldn't say that he was an apolitical person at all. So it, it was something I, I couldn't reconcile in looking at the material. How did he how did he put all of this aside? But I think it is more likely that he would have been swayed by what CLR's arguments were, was that, you know, come and shine the light in South Africa and let the world see what is happening. Maybe that was, maybe I, it seems more plausible to me that that would have been something that encouraged him to go. And but I don't think... Sorry, I was just going to say, but I don't think it was hidden information about Frank. I think, again, it was just, at the time, the newspapers were full of it. Mm -hmm. So that I was able to see a lot of the public comments on it. And But it always shocks me that people who were around, and I mean alive at the time, that, that do not know. So I, I, that is kind of a mystery to me because I don't really see any evidence that suggests that that part of the history was deliberately suppressed. Mm. You know, well, you know, it, you know, you know what's going to happen once people listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get several contacts from people giving a bit more information. So, well, so we'll that see. always happens huh? <laughs> after the fact. <laughs> And um, Vanessa, there's so many, there's so many different talking points we can have about um, your book and and everything that comes out of it. But I think one one topic to end on is symbolic on this day, the famous Australia tour of 1960, 61, and sort of you get the impression in the 40s and 50s building up to that West Indies, it was essentially a team of individuals from different islands, very kind of separate, um, try, trying to reluctantly almost work as a team together. Um, whereas that tour, it seemed to be the first real time that you've had a united team believing in a West Indies cause. And Frank was obviously critical to that. And you talk about, I, rem I read recently um, Clen C. Charan's biography of Joe Solomon, and he talks about how he idolised uh, Frank Warwell and what he'd done on that tour. Just for West Indian cricket and also West Indian identity, just how significant was that tour and what Frank Warwell managed to cultivate? Santoki, I'm so glad you raised that. When I decided to write about that tour, that chapter, which of course you can't write about Frank without that, it hit me that the actual tour, the actual test series itself has been written about brilliantly and beautifully all over. And the statistics were there. So I wanted to write about it, but not repeat that material. And then exactly what you just said became to me the guiding pillar for how to approach that, which was prior to that, it, particularly in the 50s, the West Indian teams were seen as a bunch of, as I think it was CLR who had said it, brilliant individualists. Every, but they were not a team. And what I discerned in reading this material or looking at the material is that what, the point at which Frank was working, really working towards building that team was not during the tests. It was, they played a, a host of matches, tour matches all around. And if you look at them, you would see 
the accounts of these matches, you would see how the team went from, they were scattered, they were liming, they were doing their usual flashes of brilliance. And Frank would take them to task for it. Every match is to be played as if it were a test. But not only that, he began to, uh, to get into the groove, <laughs> get into the mood of the captain in a different kind of way. And that's why I think um, the chapter before that, I call it the crossing. Because to my mind, it was where he was crossing over from being the team member to assuming the real rule of mentor, guide, and all of the things that he himself had be done when he was a teenager and when he was in his 20s. He was now using those things to understand the psyche of the young fellows on the team and there to kind of shape them. He, one of the things he preached to them all the time is that they were ambassadors. And when you think about how he approached life, I think that's how he always saw himself. And that's why he believed in having a kind of split personality a personal life and a public one. And in public, he knew he was representing the West Indies. And so that chapter, I thought this was what I wanted to highlight, the team's development and how they went. I don't want to say they were a ragtag band, they were certainly not that, but they were sparklers and they you know, would sparkle everybody had a day in the sun kind of thing and he you could actually see as they moved towards the test matches you could see how the team was transforming and becoming as as um Fran, franz jerry alexander said you know he said if frank said to jump you just want to know how high and this was what he got from them, absolute devotion and absolute respect. And I think that was what was the magic that he made on that tour. So when, as I think it was Gideon Haig did a, a review and said of the book and said that he found that chapter to be not um, engaging enough about the tests and things, it really was because I made a decision that it was the tour matches that were the site of this development. So, yeah. Did, was, do you believe that Frank was already, did becoming the captain turn him into a states person? And I guess, okay, the reason why I'm asking this question fundamentally is because you, at the time of him becoming captain, and the kind of regional significance of that for the white for the West Indies team. You also have the kind of rise and subsequent fall of the West Indies Federation going on. And I'm just intrigued if he saw himself or if he saw the institution of the West Indies cricket team as fundamental or crucial to maintaining this idea of federation. Because so much that's written about Frank is about him being able to end the kind of insularity within the team and them to see each other as an actual regional side, so to speak. I, I'm just wondering if you kind of picked up on any kind of statesman level on self-understanding um, about his role or if that was just something that was just in him anyway. I think... <clears throat> Sorry, I think it goes back a little bit to Barbados mm. in the sense that the Barbados culture was, remember, they thought themselves Little England. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, they also, I think that they had an idea that they were of superior quality to the rest of the West Indians. So in that sense i think he experienced the idea of that insularity and that 
lack of that sense of belonging to a West Indian community. So that I would say that Barbados, for example, he may have seen them as being more linked to England rather than their Caribbean neighbors. And I think because he also felt oppressed by that kind of attitude, it would have resonated with him that as a community, as a West Indian community, we had to be to rise above that insularity. He often complained about that insularity. And it was because of that, for example, um, he felt that the Leewards and the Windward Islands were also being excluded because it was the big four. It was Barbados, Jamaica, Guyana, and Trinidad. And Guyana was last in the, on that list. But they were the dominant forces within West Indies cricket in the 50s and the 40s, in more than 40s as well. But my point is that he constantly felt that we had to find the best cricketers and we could only do that if we included players from the leewards and the windwards and he campaigned for that mm. and not only campaign but his when he became a warden at the university at the university of the west indies he really did go around to all of these islands and coach and and do a lot of things you know symposia so, um, coaching sessions and things like that because he believed in that so I think he always had it in him to have this sense of regionalism mm. I think that was probably one of the things that made him outstanding from early in his life from the rest of the fellows because they were just about playing the cricket and it, I don't think there were many who were as invested in the idea of it being a regional venture as he was. You know, every, if you think about it, the, the, the 50s, the 40s, they were dominated by the whites in the region and they were from the elite groups. And so there were all these different kinds of dynamics going on at the time, but when but frank had this really focused idea on regionalism and so i think the the idea of the statesman would have come to him from early from the time he entered the university of manchester he was treated there as an international superstar there he would have encountered arthur lewis there and there, I think, a lot of serious thought about what does it mean to be West Indian would have been in his uppermost in his mind. It, you know, it would not have just been rum shop talk. It would have been a real focus on the idea of a regional identity. So I think, again, as I told you, I didn't think he was a reluctant leader he was always seeing himself in that role. And that's why a lot of the stories about his personal life would never have made it into public space because he knew he had to manage that sort, that um, reputation. So I, I don't think it was something that just came to him, the idea of being a statesman. I think Frank was always a statesman. Mm. Mm. Just, just quickly, Vanessa, do you think, obviously, Frank was pushing for that sort of regional unity. Do you think over the years, obviously, market forces have played a part in, in modern cricket with T20 leagues and everything, but do you think that belief in a regional identity of West Indian cause has slowly eroded over the years, post Frank Wall? That's a hard question, because at heart, I would hate to believe it. Mm but I don't see that much evidence that it remains a strong identifying standard for us. I would say that the things that surprise you are the things like what happened last night in the way they call out and call up 
and remind people that they belong to something. And I think there is great value in that. And I think that is why cricket remains one of our markers as who we are. Because if you look around, what else is there that exists still? We have a, a Caribbean community, the CARICOM, and one day I hope they will find a real sense of their purpose. I think we have a couple leaders now who show some real commitment to that. And you know, we would like to see them continue along that lines. But generally, it, it, I always say it is a sad thing for this region that we can only point to cricket as our West Indian thing, as our West Indian self. People have said, yeah, the university, and is, and, but the university is not what it was. And unfortunately, so too is the cricket. But I think that the cricket still holds us in a way that nothing, we, we don't have any other fabric that holds us together the way West Indian cricket is. Yeah, I, I, th I, th I think that's such an, an, an apt uh, answer there because I think, and if, the, for people who are listening to that and potentially cynical, I think the best way to describe it Shamar Joseph hails from the backwaters of Guyana, but for everybody who watched him in that test match, you everyone was claiming Shamar Joseph as their own. <laughs> as a Jamaican, he was mine. As Santoki is a guy, needs he's yours. Vanessa is, as a Trini, he's yours as well. So I, if you ever wanted to understand what it means, I think that possibly uh, describes it all yes. together. A friend of mine who is from Guyana and who is, whose surname is Joseph, Said, sent me a message saying, you see what my cousin did? <laughs> no relation, but yes, we all claim. We, and that is the thing. That is the thing. It doesn't matter where they come from. Mm -hmm. We know our West Indians and we know our West Indian selves when we see them in that way. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, this has been such a great conversation, but with all guests who come on the podcast, whether they're players, administrators, journalists, we always finish with one big, big final question. So I'm going to let Mash do the, the honours for this one. Okay. Most definitely. So I'm going to split it in two um, because I think you, you, can get, you can get two answers here. So of all the cricket, cricketers, cricket stories that you've told um, through your career, and those you've seen live on TV, whatever it might be, who have, who has been your favourite West Indian batter and bowler to watch in your lifetime? That is so horrible <laughs> to ask. In my whole, in all the years that I have been writing about cricket, yeah. I have always been snooty about questions like that. <laughs> because I think that is a boy's question <laughs> because they're the ones who are always asking the question, who is your favorite? Who is your favorite batter? Who is your favorite bowler? I, I will not be able to answer that because I have too many and they have so many different qualities. I will just say, I don't assess based so much on technical prowess. Okay. And in that sense, I would easily say Michael Holding. I would say Ian Bishop as people who have represented us beautifully. There are other bowlers whom I really think are magical in their technical ability. But you see, you just made me do it. Michael and Ian have represented the West Indies, not just as fast bowlers, but as West Indians, uh, in whom, you know, who have spoken up for us in every forum. And of course, Frank. Listen, you, you said you wouldn't, you, 
You said you wouldn't answer. You said you wouldn't answer, but you have given, you've given an answer. You've given an answer all the same. And do you know what? I think that's a really good answer to give because every time you ask that question, you're the first person to not just base it on what did they do Technically. on the field. Yeah, because arguably the whole point of being a West Indian cricketer is, well, it's beyond the boundary. It's so much more than just being a cricketer. So that makes that makes sense as an answer that you've given there, to be fair. Well, I will always say that we have had over the years, everybody has run all kinds of polls and tools on who is the greatest this and who is the greatest that. And I have always resisted because first we have to say, what do we mean when we ask who is great? Mm. What are the qualities we are looking for? And for me, as I said, there are so many really great in the sense of technically fantastic players. And I would feel embarrassed to name just one or two because it, it, it can't, it can't be, right? But for me, the, the quality of greatness really comes from the character. People like Viv. I mean, look, you're going to make me go down that road. But I was, I was going to say, no, you can't, you can't have, I'll give you the first three. You're not having four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Yeah, and that's why I can't do it because my criteria has to be really my favorites are the people who have represented West Indians. I'm gonna the, the next person who comes on, I'm gonna change the nature of the question just because you've made me realize that question must change. So I am gonna change it. That's your legacy <laughs> on the Caribbean cricket podcast. The question, that's <laughs> okay. Over to you. Yeah, as Vanessa, as I said, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And to anyone watching, obviously, Son of Grace is out, definitely out in the UK. I'm assuming it's available to order globally as well. Well worth a read. Um, so much I learned, I learned so much from it. So informative, such a great narrative, and it's something I've been recommending to family and friends over the past few days. So, it's been an absolute pleasure, Vanessa. Thank you so much for giving up some time and coming on the Caribbean Cricket Podcast. Thank you. It was a real pleasure for me too. Absolutely wonderful. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we promised you, as ever, every now and again, we, 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 we go and do those deep dive episodes. You know that we're not just a what's going on right now um, podcast. We like to look at the annals of West Indian history and make sure, as Vanessa said right at the start, make sure that West Indians are telling West Indian stories. Never, ever lose sight of that, people. We must own our own narrative on, the, on, on these kind of things. So thank you, Vanessa, for coming on. Please, everyone, go get the book. Look in the descriptions below. I'll put a couple of links to where you can order the books from, uh, a couple of reviews on the books, so on and so forth. Please support um, the book and the project that Vanessa has put together. We hope this podcast has kind of whet your appetite to, to go and get it. And uh, thank you, Vanessa, once more. We've been the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, everyone. Thank you and good night. We rule the cricket world. Now the rules. Welcome to the Caribbean Cricket Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things West Indies cricket, by the fans, for the fans.